I bet as you're studying Isaiah that you are enjoying David Arthur as much as I enjoy listening to him. It's been so wonderful to have him step in and help teach Isaiah part two. You know, this is what it's all about. It doesn't focus on an individual. It focuses on the word of God. And you're going to be so blessed today to hear from David Arthur, the vice president of teaching and training at Precept. Have you ever wondered how much God loves you? You ever wondered how much he will give to bring you back to himself in reconciliation? Have you ever wondered what it cost him to make you his own? Today in Isaiah 53, we will explore together the extent of God's love as shown to us in and through the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is David Arthur, and I'm so glad you've come to study God's Word with me today. We're going to look and explore together and discover God's truth for ourselves in one of the most beautiful chapters of all Scripture. It's Isaiah chapter 53. Here we find the servant of the Lord being described in great detail. Thousands of years before Jesus Christ came, it was prophesied of how he would suffer for our sins. We've already looked at who he was. He was a nobody. He was not one that we would expect, despised, rejected, punished, smitten by God. And yet we find out that he was the arm of the Lord being revealed. So how did he suffer? What was it like? We've already noted several verbs and several descriptions throughout this text to describe what he went through and what he was like. Things like despised and forsaken and stricken and pierced and crushed. But today we're going to look at how did he suffer. And the first thing I want you to see is he suffered like a criminal. Look with me at verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he, the servant, was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, and here's why, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. He was cut off. He was cut off and he was, he was described as one who was removed from the land of the living. And it was by oppression and judgment that he was taken away. Jesus, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, the one described here in Isaiah 53, suffered first as a criminal. One who took on sins. One who realized that he must bear our sins for us to be forgiven by God. For us to be reconciled back to his, our Heavenly Father. And so he was taken away and he was judged as a criminal. Also, look at chapter 52, uh, verses 13 and 14 again. He says, Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. But it then changes, verse 14, Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Here in the Hebrew language, what is being described is one that was beaten so severely that his human likeness changed, that his physique changed. How was he beaten? We find out from the New Testament that they began the beatings of Jesus with a thing called a cat of nine tails. This would be a, 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 a weapon that would be a piece of wood and nailed to it with these several leather straps, nine to be exact. And on each strap would be things like glass and metal and, uh, and other very sharp objects. And they would take this thing, after tying down the victim, they would take this strap and they would strike the victim. And then the straps would land, wrap around the torso, and grab the skin and lock in. Once it was set, 
then the one bringing the torture would then rip the cat of nine tails back, pulling off flesh, breaking bones, exposing organs. History tells us that many people died from just this part of the beating. And Jesus, it was said, that He went down and He took our beatings. In verse 14 of chapter 52, it said it was so severe that it was like, um, like He lost His manhood. It was like He lost his, the way He appeared as a man. He was marred uh, beyond comprehension. He was beaten beyond comprehension. How did He suffer? Well, first He suffered as a criminal. As if one who had done something wrong, one as if he had been a thief or a murderer or an adulterer, a liar, a hater, one who was violent. He suffered at the, at the hands of the people as if he was a criminal, but he also suffered physically. He was be- beaten with cattails. He was eventually uh, taken to Golgotha where he was pinned to a tree. He was nailed with his hands onto this tree and he hung there without thirst in the middle of the heat of the day and he hung there in shame and humiliation. That's how he suffered. But look at verse 5. Here's some more uh, descriptions of his suffering. It says, But he, the servant of the Lord, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Listen to these verbs again. He was pierced through. That's a fatal wound. He was crushed. Uh, There you get the idea of His form being reshaped. He was chastened, and His scourging is what brought us healing. When we say that Jesus Christ suffered for our sins, we're not just saying that He experienced some trauma, that He experienced some temporary trauma, but that He was literally beaten. Now think with me for a moment. Who was beating Him? We understand from the Gospels it was the Romans, the soldiers. He was put there by the hands of men. And though in His power, and though in His deity, He had the ability at any minute to change the environment. The way I understand who Jesus Christ is, is He is the one who sustains us. Which, that means scientifically, He's the one that holds our molecules together. Think with me, my friend. He allowed those whom He had created, those men whom He shaped, and those men whom He sustained second by second to mock Him, to reach up and to grab His beard and to pull His beard out, to spit in His face and to mock Him. Oh, hail King of the Jews! Though He had the power at any minute to dissolve them to dust from which they came, He sustained them even as they beat Him even as they took the cat of nine tails. And at time after time, they began to beat him and pulling off his flesh. And so eventually, he was this bloody mass of a man. As Isaiah describes, his appearance was marred more than any man. Who is this Jesus? Why does he suffer this way? Why would he allow those whom he has created to do this? And how would he react? I wonder what I would do if I were God. And I looked from my throne above and I saw my own son with all ability, with all divinity, not handicapped in any way, willingly submitting himself to the abuse of mere mortals. What would I do? What would I be like? We'll look. The text answers those questions in Isaiah 53. The text tells us why he went through this. The text tells us how he responded. The text even tells us the response of the Heavenly Father during this ordeal of suffering. We have here before us one who is marred. We we saw in verse 8 that he was cut off. Now this is a, a reference that we could tie to Daniel chapter 9 verse 26. 
In Daniel 9, verse 26, we see that there are 70 weeks being described. This is prophetic. 70 weeks being described. And one of the things that will take place in those 70 weeks is to make atonement for sin. That's exactly what Jesus is doing. He is making atonement for his sin by suffering at the hands of mere mortals. He suffered as a criminal. He suffered as one who had sinned. But we saw earlier that he had not done He had not done those things that we considered him guilty of, that he had not actually committed any violence, that there was no deceit found in his mouth, according to verse 8 and verse 7. So how does he do it? He says that all of us, all of us like sheep have gone astray, but he did not. He willingly went to the cross. He was not a victim He was not one who was at the wrong place at the wrong time. We find out again in verse 1 that it was the arm of the Lord being revealed. Jesus not only suffered, this is very important for you to understand, He not only suffered physical abuse, but He also suffered things that really, quite honestly, fail in comparison to the abuse He suffered as receiving our sins upon Himself. He received sins, though He had never lusted, Listen to me, though he had never lusted, he took on all the filthy thoughts, all the filthy sins of all people who have lusted. Though he had never had an angry thought, he took on bitterness and anger and hatred and envy. Though he had never struck a man in violence, though he had never sinned against another one physically, he took on all the sins of those who used their strength and their brutality. For their own pleasure, at the demise of the weak and the helpless. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, that though he knew no sin, he became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. How did he suffer? Yes, he suffered as a criminal. Yes, he suffered uh, physically. He, he suffered tremendous physically. But he suffered even tremendously, exponentially greater in the spiritual realm as He took on our sins. As He laid, it says, we had a runaway like sheep, it said, but the Lord turned and caused the iniquity, the sin of all of us. That includes you and that includes me. That includes the people on death row at this very moment. He took on the sins of the world. And he laid them upon his son. I used to think that Jesus was the substitutionary lamb that was sent out into the wilderness. But after reading Isaiah 53, it's clear he was the lamb that was laid upon the altar. That was not allowed to go free in the wilderness. But he was laid upon the altar. And his blood was shed for our transgressions, for our iniquities. We're going to see more of how he responded. We're going to see and watch how does Jesus respond to this kind of suffering. How will he respond? We'll see in just a moment. Welcome back. I'm so glad you're studying Isaiah 53 with me today. As we look at the servant of the Lord and how he's suffering, today we're going to look at why he's suffering. By the way, if you want to join us in inductive Bible study and to study it for yourself, let me encourage you to go to our website, preceptsforlife.com. And there you can download a free study guide that will walk you through step by step exactly what I'm doing as I study the scriptures myself. So let's go to our text. We see in Isaiah 53, verse 7, that he was oppressed and that he was afflicted. But here's a question. How did he respond? How did he respond to allowing mere mortals bring persecution and suffering his way? How, how did he respond to that? Look what it says. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And in verse 7 it says, Yet he did not open his mouth. What was he like? He was like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. Can you picture it? 
is what he's like. He's, well, he's like a sheep, a sheep that doesn't know what's going on, a sheep that's kind of clueless. And, you know, thinking about what it had for breakfast that day, it goes to the slaughterhouse. But the text makes it very clear. He did not open his mouth. Yet, in contrast to his oppression, his affliction, yet he did not open his mouth. Think with me biblically for a minute. What what does it mean for God to open His mouth? In Genesis 1, let's go look at Genesis 1. The very first words of Scripture tell us about God opening His mouth. Genesis 1 verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Verse 3, here comes God's first action. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God did what? How did God create light? It said, God said, let there be light. Now think with me for a minute. What happened when God opened his mouth and said, let there be light? There were stars and galaxies that today, even after thousands of years of science, we still can't reach the end of it with a telescope much less with a rocket ship. He created stars that are enormous. And Psalms 19.1 says they have a sole purpose, and that is to declare the glory of God to His creation, to you and to me. God said, let there be light. And over and over again in Genesis 1, God said, God said, God said. In other words, when God opened His mouth, things that did not exist came into existence for the very first time. Another story about God opening His mouth is in Exodus chapter 19. Here God decides to go and He goes to Moses and He says to Moses, Moses, I want you to go up on Mount Sinai. And so He he takes him to this mountain uh, right in the middle and He has the people of Israel camp on both sides of the mountain. But He says to him very clearly, do not under any circumstance let them touch even the base of the mountain. Don't even let your beast touch the base of the mountain. And here's why. If you touch them, they will be destroyed. And so Moses, the only one allowed to touch the mountain, goes to the top of the mountain, and there a big cloud comes down and, and consumes the top of the mountain. So you can no longer see the top of the mountain. And it says, Then the Lord spoke. It's described in Exodus 19 and 20 and some other places as God's speaking sounds like thunder. It sounds like a cosmic storm on top of the mountain. In fact, it was so frightening that when Moses came back to the mountain to talk to the people, the first thing they told Moses was, listen, don't let him speak again. For surely, if he speaks again, we will die. You see, the mountain shook. The people's hearts were quaking with fear at the very voice of God. What happens when God opens His mouth? Well, in Genesis 1, He creates stars and galaxies. In in Exodus, when He opens His mouth, mountains shake. And people's hearts quake with fear. Think about Jesus when He opened His mouth. Lazarus, a friend of His, is dead. And Lazarus is in the grave for several days. And Jesus walks up and seeing the pain and suffering of his friends, simply speaks to Lazarus. And he says to Lazarus, come forth. A dead man becomes a live man. When God spoke through Jesus, when Jesus spoke to Lazarus, he went from being dead to being alive. You remember when Jesus was on the boat and there he was and he was sound asleep and a great storm came up on the Sea of Galilee and surely all the disciples thought, this is it. This is the day we die. And so they shake Jesus. They wake him up and say, help, we are about to die from this storm. And Jesus said simply, you know, you have little faith. And he stands up out of the boat. He looks at the stormy sea and he simply says, stop. And the text says, immediately, the winds and the waves stopped. What happens when God opens His mouth? We find out in Revelation chapter 19. Let's go to Revelation 19 together. We find out in Revelation 19, uh, this is towards the end. This is the end of time. This will be the culmination of history. 
In Revelation chapter 19, we see Jesus uh, in verse 11 as one who rides a white horse. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. Verse 12 tells us what he looks like. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And then verse 14, The armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The book of Revelation opened up with a very similar scene of Jesus as describing him as one who has a a sword that comes out of his mouth. What does it look like when the lamb doesn't open his mouth? He has the power simply to create and to destroy. He has the power to take a mountain and shake it at its very foundations with his voice. He has the power to speak to a man who has been in a tomb for several days and say, get up. And life is renewed and life is given back to the dead man. He has the power to control the elements of wind and waves. And yet we find out his reaction to his judgment is that though he had the power to destroy all living creatures, he kept his mouth closed. That's real power. That's amazing control. That shows a willingness, a determination. That's his face set like flint on the mission that God sent him to do. That God, though he was able to destroy all those who were bringing him affliction and suffering, and abuse and beating him with a cat of nine tails and and wanting to pin him to a tree, though he could have destroyed them with one small word, he did not open his mouth. Let me ask you, friend, what does that tell you about his love? What does that tell you about his desire to see you be his own, to be his child? What does that tell you about the willingness of the Messiah to suffer? Why? That you might be His Son. That you might be restored and forgiven and reconciled. That is some power. Thousands of years after our text in Isaiah 53, we get to listen in to a divine conversation. A conversation between the father and his son in the Garden of Gethsemane. It is just before Jesus is allowing himself to be taken by mere mortals into a house to be beaten and mocked and ridiculed, to have his beard plucked out, to have his face spit upon. And as we have seen in Isaiah 50, he gave himself, he gave his back to those who would beat him. And he did not keep himself away from humiliation. Does that tell you just how precious you are to your heavenly father? For our sins, he says, we were like sheep. For our sins, he says, we have gone astray. And yet to bring us back into the path of righteousness to where he would have us be, he allowed himself to be suffer. He allowed himself to suffer at the hands of mere mortals. And verse 7 says, though he was oppressed and though he was afflicted, yet, yet he did not open his mouth. Oh, how precious you are to your Savior, that he would go to such extent 
to achieve our salvation. Thank you for watching today. To order your copy of today's program, log on to our website at preceptsforlife.com. To download your free copy of the study guide or to find out more about Precept Ministries International, click on our website or call us today at 1-800-763-1990. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life. Jesus, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, the one described here in Isaiah 53, suffered first as a criminal, one who took on sins, one who realized that he must bear our sins for us to be forgiven by God. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.